Oh, okay, it's it's working now. So, uh, so I'm Tom. Um, I'm working at CrowdStrike as uh, an intelligence analyst intern, but that has nothing to do with this talk. I, I wrote the slides about four months ago, and I haven't seen them since. So I'm presenting to myself as much as I'm presenting to you guys. <laughs> so, um, so my talk is on how code compilation works. So let's start off by talking about why it's important to understand why it works. Um, I mean, compilers are tools which a lot of us will have used. Um, and it's good to understand how our tools work to be able to use them most effectively. And it helps us understand attack vectors which we otherwise wouldn't have considered. Um, with there was a quote I was gonna like say, but I forgot what it is. Oh well. Um, <laughs> moving on. So uh, let's have. Uh, so we're gonna look at a general overview of like this is kind of a high level of how a compiler pipeline might look. There's lexing, parsing, semantic analysis, optimization, and code generation. We'll go through each step and explain what it is and how it works. So starting with lexing, lexing effectively takes a string of characters and turns them into tokens that have meaning. So let's say var a equals var b plus 100. You split that up character by character, then you remove the white space, you group them up into strings, into sorry, tokens, and then you give those tokens meanings. So like var a and var b are identifiers, 100 is an integer, and equal and plus are symbols. Um, those tokens are then fed into the parser. The parser takes these tokens and generates what's called a, an abstract syntax tree. The, um, the syntax tree effectively takes the tokens which have a bit of meaning in terms of what the um, or what the tokens are, and it kind of gives context to them. So by looking at the syntax tree, you can see that you perform addition on var a plus 100, and then you perform assignment between var a and the result of that addition. You can kind of follow the tree logically and um, and work out what what uh, uh, lexemes the tokens produced by the lexer actually mean. Um, it also enforces structure. Parsing is the stage where any syntax errors would be picked up on. Because if something can't be turned into an abstract syntax tree, that means there's some mistake somewhere in the syntax of it. Um, however, parsers can't pick up on more um, on, on, on more complicated um, issues, which is where semantic analysis comes in. Parsing enforces the structure of your code. Semantic analysis make sure your code actually makes sense. Um, semantic analysis could be its own talk. It's a very, very complex topic. Um, but the two bits of semantic analysis which I want to cover are type checking and name binding, which are probably the most important bits. Uh, type checking is just the process of verifying and enforcing types, which is um, more relevant to uh, dynamically typed languages like Python um, and JavaScript, although JavaScript is, yeah. <laughs> so um, if, if we take uh, this example code, of our a equals words, and we try to add 102 to it, this would result in a type error. And that's picked up on through type checking, because, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, because var a is assigned um, the type string, and you can't implicitly add an integer to a string, that, uh, hence the type error. It also applies to uh, passing things into uh, functions as parameters. So if you try and pass 12.5 into a function that takes a character, that's also going to result in a type error because you can't pass a float in where you where it's expecting a character. And the type checking also deals with type inferences. So if var b is equal to the result of a function, then it'll um, infer what type var b is going to be based on the return value of the function. However, at this stage, we don't know what the function is returning. Um, so that's where name binding comes in. Name binding effectively associates code with um, with identifiers. So if we, um, it's, sorry, yeah. So there's two types of. I don't remember what I actually put in the presentation, so I'm kind of seeing it at the same time you are. Um, so there's two types of name binding: the static name binding and dynamic name binding. Static is uh, static happens at compile time. Um, it's things that the compiler knows whilst uh, uh, with just the source code. And dynamic um, name binding takes place whilst the process is running. Things like dynamic dispatch in C++, um, where you're 
where, where at compile time, it's impossible to work out what a function is, for example. Like if you're loading in a DLL. Um, so if we take this example code, we know from the integer return type of function b that var b is going to be an integer. So then we can perform um, type checking to make sure that var b double equals 5 is a valid expression because you're comparing an integer to an integer. Um, yeah, and so then moving on to optimization. Again, optimization is a huge topic and it could also be its own talk. Um, but there's two optimizations which make up the vast majority of performance gains when compiling code. Uh, that's inlining and partial evaluation. Inlining is the process of putting functions within functions. When you call a function, it's quite an expensive operation for a CPU to do. It will take several lines of code, uh, several instructions even, to um, it's to call a function because you need uh, there's um, shifting around with registers, there's uh, all kinds of things to switch context. Um, so if it, let's take, let's take this example code. Um, if uh, we have um, a function b which is very very simple, all it does is return a, 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 a and we reference that function in func c. So what we can do is we can get rid of function b and replace the return value in function c. This increases the size of the code, but it reduces the number of context switches and it reduces the number of um, yeah, the, the number of functions that have to be called, which increases performance. And for small functions, this makes sense. Um, this doesn't happen with very long functions. So the first function, very, very long function, would not um, go through inlining. Um, you might assume that that's because it's going to make the code too big. But that's not actually completely the case. It can also reduce performance if you inline um, functions that are too large. Because what the CPU does is it will cache the next few instructions so that it can execute them more quickly without having to go uh, to memory. Um, and if you skip past through too many lines of code, let's say if var c um, is false, which it is in this case, if it skips past the very, very long function, it will skip to some code which hasn't been cached yet. And so then it has to go to memory to receive it, uh, to retrieve it. This is called a cache miss, which, um, which could happen if you inline functions which are too long. Um, there's supposed to be animations there to kind of like show what I was just talking about, but I, 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 I'm just going to hope I explained it well enough. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, the other part of, um, uh, the other part of, uh, the other optimization I want to talk about is partial evaluation which is where you propagate known information. So let's take this example code again. We know that var c is equal to false, and assuming that var c doesn't change um, before func c is called, we know that um, func c will never enter the very, very long function. It will only ever enter um, the, the, the um, function b. If you replace the function b with a, a, a uh, sorry, if you replace the, um, if you replace the call to function b with just its code, and we also get rid of the um, if statement because we know that that's nev it's never going to go into the first condition. I mean, this is quite an extreme example, but you can see how much code has been kind of reduced through inlining and partial evaluation. Um, uh, and partial evaluation also refers uh, also applies to something called constant folding, which is where rather than having a constant in somewhere in your code which has to be referenced constantly. Uh, compilers will sometimes take the constant and just replace every every um, every time that uh, constant is referenced with the value of it. So if we look at this code, we could replace every reference to const a with just 533. And then that allows us to look at func b, where we're adding an integer to a constant, and we can evaluate that during compile time, which is one less instruction for the, for the CPU to do whilst in runtime, hence improving performance. So after all of these stages of compilation, you finally get to code generation, which there isn't an awful lot to talk about, but there's kind of three main tasks in, in code generation. It, there's instruction selection, which is deciding which instructions to use in CISC architectures, uh, complex instruction sets, um, like Intel and AMD. Um, there are many, many functions that can do the same things. And so the, so the compiler has to decide which functions to use to do certain things. There's also instruction scheduling, uh, 
and which is what order to put those instructions in. Because the order of instructions can drastically change um, change the performance. And just as an example, um, over, over term time, I work as a researcher at the university, uh, and I uh, do embedded system security stuff. Um, I was writing some code for an embedded system, and I was writing assembly directly. But, um, it was in, in C, I'm not that insane. <laughs> um, it, it was in line assembly in C. Uh, I added, uh, I changed some instructions about um, whilst trying effectively refactoring it, and it reduced performance. It it was like eight hundred percent slower um, <laughs> through through like a single change of swapping around instructions. It, it it can have a bigger impact than than you'd expect. And then there's also register allocation, which is just deciding which registers refer to which um, variables, which is also quite important because um, oftentimes. Well, uh, uh, oftentimes different registers can be accessed at slightly different speeds, and variables which are referenced more often should be put into quicker registers to then be accessed quicker. So, yeah, that was the entire compiler pipeline. Um, this doesn't really represent what a compiler looks like. This, so old LLVM, um, uh, sorry, old school C compilers might look like this. But modern compilers um, are quite different. This is what an LLVM compiler might look like, which is a kind of a more modern C compiler, where rather than having one stage of optimization, you have what's called an intermediate representation, which is kind of in between your source code and the actual um, machine code that's generated at the end. And you can apply optimizations over and over again on that intermediate representation. And that allows you to kind of achieve more optimizations than you otherwise could um, if you had just... Um, if you just had one pass of optimization. Um, C Sharp, for example, uh, as another example, um, also uses an intermediate representation. They don't call it that, they call it an intermediate language, but I'm going to use the same term everywhere because it's basically the same thing. Um, C Sharp uses what's called a just-in-time compiler. So when you execute a C Sharp program, unless you specify in the compiler to compile it as machine code, it will actually just output um, a portable executable with the intermediate language. And the intermediate language um, will, uh, a just in time compiler will compile things just in time. So everything before the blue wall happens at compile time, everything after happens at runtime. And during runtime, the uh, just in time compiler will apply optimizations and go do code generation just before, exe uh, just before instructions are executed. This has the added advantage of um, oftentimes during runtime, with the context of what's happening right now, you can apply optimizations which you otherwise couldn't, which can sometimes lead to more efficient code. Or oftentimes not, but sometimes if there is context um, during runtime that the compiler can use, it can result in more efficient, um, more efficient machine code being generated. And uh, this is what an interpreted language like um, Java or um, uh, Python might look like. And the, um, and so the, the way um, interpreted languages work is the intermediate representation goes into what's called a virtual machine, which runs at runtime. And the virtual machine can decide whether to go through code generation or go through the interpreter. The interpreter allows the virtual machine to uh, to kind of have... Um, it's much slower, but it has more of an understanding of what's going on and, and can therefore feed into the optimizations. And um, if the code goes to code um, generation. Between the virtual machine and code generation, optimization will be applied based on uh, information that the interpreter has to therefore produce more efficient code. Um, I was briefly considering making every diagram like this. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Um, so, um, so, so, so we talked about how compilers work. But we've not really talked about how kind of languages are designed, how the parser knows what structure to enforce, how the semantic, anal uh, how semantic analysis knows what to kind of expect. And those are kind of defined in what's called a formal grammar. A, yeah, formal grammars uh, define the structure of languages. Um, it defines how to lex, it defines how to parse, it defines semantic analysis. So, um, so 
so if we take this example again from parsing, where we have var a equals var b plus 100, a simple formal grammar for this might look like this, where we say an assignment is an integer plus an equal sign plus an expression, an expression is an integer plus an uh, plus sign plus an integer, an expression is also an integer, and an expression can also be nothing. So we can then we can then say um, if we know var b is an integer, we have two integers. Um, we have two integers, so we can turn that into an expression, and then we can use the assignment to turn this into an assignment. Um, so we've evaluated the syntax tree as being an assignment um, through using this formal grammar. So, um, so this would be kind of a more general formal grammar that would cover more expressions. This is also not what an actual formal grammar would look like, but um, you can kind of see how um, you can apply the same concepts to this, where values can be any type of variable. Um, a variable can also be an expression, it can be nothing, and then you define what an expression is and you define what an assignment is. If we were to write this properly in what's called BNF, which is what formal grammars are typically written in, um, it would look more like this. Uh, the reason I went through kind of a more casual look at it is just so that it's less intimidating than than hitting you with this straight away. Um, the epsilon in this case just means nothing. So you can say a value is equal is equal to epsilon or an expression. That means it can be equal to nothing or an expression. So um, as a practical example, let's look at JSON in uh, BNF. This is the formal grammar for JSON. Um, and we have a bit of JSON on the side. So, so we can look at... Um, we, we, we go as far in as possible. The apple and apple two are both values, so we can replace those with values. Then, um, then we have a pair because we have a string liter literal, a colon, and a value. So then we can turn those into pairs. Then we have pairs and t pairs, so we can turn the entire thing into pairs, and then um, those become objects. And then with values, values question mark and t values. Uh, the array of objects becomes values, and then we apply the same idea again with the rest of the rules to turn everything into pairs. And then because we have pairs between two um, objects, uh, the two um, curly brackets, that becomes an object. So we can evaluate kind of by hand a JSON expression using its formal grammar um, and evaluate the object into an object. Um, and, and yeah. So then, finally, uh, supply chain attacks. So I kind of referenced at the beginning of the talk that understanding how compilers work can allow us to consider attack vectors which we otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and well, one such attack vector, um, I'm, I'm going to explain now. So compilers are compiled by compilers. You need a compiler to make a compiler. And compiler modifications can quite easily propagate. Because if you modify a compiler and that compiler is used to make another compiler, you can propagate that change from the first compiler into the second, and then from the second into whatever else. Um, there was a talk, uh, sorry, there was a paper in 1984, um, Reflections on Trusting Trust, which came up with the idea of modifying a C compiler to include malicious code um, in anything it. Um, in anything it compiled, and then also propagating that change to any compilers compiled by that compiler. Um, the idea being that you could have perfectly secure source code. Um, you could build it in a perfectly secure environment, but um, if the compiler is compiled by a malicious compiler, then your code would become malicious through compilation. It, it's, a, it's a supply chain attack. And um, this was actually, um, it sounds very theoretical, but this was actually, this actually happened in 2015. Um, the Microsoft Visual Studio C++ compiler um, was making calls to Microsoft telemetry um, libraries, which Microsoft had injected into it. So even if your code wasn't sending telemetry to Microsoft, Microsoft had injected code into their compiler to send telemetry back to them, um, which kind of illustrates that this, this um, can actually happen. And yeah, even complete analysis of the source code won't pick up on any vulnerabilities, because if you analyze a source code, that's not where the malicious code is being injected. It's 
during compilation, which is what makes this so difficult to... Uh, it's such kind of an insidious attack vector. Um, there is also one remediation I want to discuss about this, which is diverse double compilation. Um, it was discussed in in Wheeler's PhD dis- dissertation, and it's basically the idea of using a trusted compiler within the same family of compilers. So uh, compilers come in kind of families where if you change one compiler to make it more efficient or whatever, that's a new compiler, but it's in the same family as the old compiler. Um, if you have one known good compiler within a family, you can um, you can test the output of the new compiler versus the old compiler, um, and I, I don't exactly remember the formal proof, but there was a proof that you can show there's even with optimization changes, you can show that the two pieces of code that were generated are identical in function. The idea being that if you have a non-good compiler, you can then verify an unknown compiler to make sure that that's also not had uh, not injecting malicious code into your into the code you're compiling with it. Um, yeah, so that's the end. Sorry for the complete. Um, this is the first time I've seen the presentation in four months. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> any questions? Any questions? Yeah. So I guess a modern format of attack is kind of written up by Nicholas Nicholas Pichier and Ross Anderson, talked about um, using bidirectional unprintable characters in streams that um, box. Um, how um, they're part of the systems. So I'm thinking about AI where you're feeding in character when you actually, if you don't have appropriate input validation, you end up with all sorts of messes that you may end. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where some kind of attack would happen. Um, I work in low level embedded systems for yeah. crypto modules. I do worry about this sort of thing. Um, we also worry about um, things like smart contracts, which means solidity, where I can't formally verify the compiler. Um, so I, I don't know, it was just an observation in the comment. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so, so what exactly is it you want me to comment so on? With the, I'm just wondering modern applications for such compiler attacks. For such compiler attacks? I mean, um, I, I'm not very familiar in how smart contracts are created, but from my understanding there is some kind of compilation step. Um, I suppose given how niche smart contracts are, it could be possible to create a compiler which will add some kind of factor which allows you to break the smart contract without the person who's writing it being um, aware. And from my understanding, smart contracts are generally, uh, when they're audited, they're they're auditing the smart contract itself, not the compiled uh, kind of output of it. And so it, that would pass audits without anyone really noticing. Um, I, I think that's probably pr- probably a quite possible um, attack vector in that context. Yeah. So could another type of remediation be maybe automated testing that tests the compiled code? So it depends on what kind of malicious behavior we're talking about. Could that be an option? Um, I think the only issue with that would be you don't really know what the compiler might be injecting into your code. Yeah. If you, like what, what types of things? Are yeah. There? Like if you have some idea of what malicious code might be injected, you could test for that. But if it's just a case of malicious code might be injected, you don't know what that is. That wouldn't really work. Unless you want what's typically done. And yeah, yeah. Typically Straight that your your, your code doesn't have that. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, John.